Uh, thanks, Madhu and, and Evan, for letting me be part of this. This is uh, really a fascinating Congress, and, and, and it's uh, something that, that I think we can truly build on as we move forward. My job is pretty easy. I get to introduce uh, the, the, the three speakers um, uh, dealing with the social dimensions of food security. And the first one is Helmut Havrel uh, from uh, the University of Alpen Andrea. <laughs> And he's going to be talking on global human uh, appropriation of net primary production, a biophysical approach to analyze systemic uh, feedbacks on the global land system. So welcome. Yeah, th thank you very much for the kind introduction and, and for inviting me, actually. I, as, as you've seen, I've come quite a way. Good, good news is we have a direct flight from <laughs> Vienna to Chicago, so it was a little bit easier. <laughs> uh, so, well, the human appropriation of net primary production will be the main topic of my talk, and because this is such a long, cumbersome word to say, I usually use the abbreviation, which is HUMP. So I'm kind, kind, of, kind of infamous as Mr. HUMP. <laughs> Actually, was invited by an American ecologist, Peter Vitosek. Uh, so I will start by dis describing what HUMP actually is. Uh, I will go into some results we've developed in recent years, actually many years, a lot of empirical work to, to work out these maps and, and trajectories. I will talk a little bit ab about HUMP efficiency, so what can we learn from uh, patterns both in, in time and space, uh, how efficiently we can deal with that. Uh, and then I will show you some results of a biomass balance model we have derived based on this hump uh, and biomass flow information behind it and have some concluding remarks. So basically this is nothing very new, it's based also something that has been underlying the global land project very much is the idea is that land is an integrated socio-ecological system where humans uh, purposefully change uh, the land in order to get a certain return in terms of resources like biomass, agricultural or forestry biomass, or services. So many ecosystem services are not just something ecosystems deliver on their own, but they do deliver it because humans change or manage the land. And this. And HUMP is one indicator to try to uh, describe actually what's going on in biophysical terms. Uh, uh, so basically the idea is that uh, we compare three uh, steps in the process. Basically we, we, we compare the changes that result from introducing land management compared to a hypothetical natural state, what ecologists call potential natural vegetation, which is of course a reconstruction which we do, and it's, uh, it's a concept that is some uh, tradition in vegetation ecology. Uh, and basically, of course, when humans introduce land use activities, they change the productivity of the land because they replace the natural vegetation with a different set of vegetation and the productivity of that vegetation may be different, and that's what we call the hump related to land use change, or hump luck. Uh, and then, of course, one of the main reasons, not the only one for uh, using the land, is that we want to get some products out of it, we want to harvest biomass, and that's quite a simple, uh, conceptually simple thing here, which we call that the hump harvested, or hump half. And the human appropriation of MPP or HUMP is just the sum total of these two processes. Um, well, and why would one be interested in studying that? As I've said already, uh, ecologists like Peter Wittusek, Pamela Madsen, uh, Ehrlich and others have been interested in the human domination of ecosystems around the globe and they have published a quite influential paper in bioscience in 1986. Actually, there was even an earlier attempt to do the same thing by, uh, by Leet and Whitaker, published in the inaugural issue of Human Ecology in 1973, so it's a quite venerable concept, <laughs> if I may say so. Uh, and this has been taken up uh, by many people because they thought of that as a measure of the scale of human activities on planet Earth. Also in the context of limits to growth, 
which has become criticized with some good reasons, and I will not go into that now, but when I show the global trajectory, you, you may see why uh, this has been a, a little bit too simplified at that time. But, of course, hump is also related to human-induced changes in global biogeochemical cycles, because uh, these changes in productivity or the harvest of biomass is, of course, related to changes in carbon stocks and flows, in changes in, in water flows or nutrient flows. Uh, so you can relate it basically to many global biogeochemical processes. And it ho has also been discussed in relation to the planetary boundary concept by Steve Running, for example, and I've heard that uh, the organizer here has been <laughs> discussing this with Steve already, so uh, perhaps I can shed a new angle on that as well. Uh, I've also been involved in some empirical studies of how hump may be related to biodiversity, which is quite a data-intensive uh, thing to analyze. The basic theory behind that is the species energy hypothesis. I will not go into that, but we've done some empirical analysis also based on this idea. And of course, uh, it's a measure of land use intensity, and this is probably what we have done most work on, and I will show that in this presentation a lot. Uh, this is just to kind of uh, summarize uh, the definition. Uh, what may be important is, um, of course, the actual vegetation may also be more productive than potential vegetation. I will show where we think on the planet that happens. Uh, and our notion of harvested hump is uh, inclusive, so it includes also biomass that is affected by harvesting processes but not actually harvested and used by humans, like for example crop residues or some, uh, some uh, subterranean uh, components like roots of wheat plants, for example. We define as appropriated. You may define that otherwise if you prefer. Just to, to tell you, the notion of Peter Witusek was even more encompassing because he would uh, account for the whole productivity of a wheat field as appropriated, no matter whether this biomass ever entered any economic processing. So this, the, the difference between our results and his results is basically a difference in definitions. Uh, so, but this is the definition we work with, with here. Uh, and it's just to, important to remind that because then in the following slides you will see a lot of these abbreviations. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, oh, yeah, you can, uh, it's not very good on my screen, but I think it's reasonable here. Uh, this is hump luck globally, so this is how much human land use affects productivity of ecosystems around the globe. Uh, when we did this in 2006, 2007, we were quite, uh, we also looked at a study done by Ruth de Vries, and we found a similar order of magnitude, and we were quite <laughs> happy about that. Uh, so basically, the, 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 uh, this map shows where we think that uh, humans change through land use activities productivity, and I said that there are some regions, the, the blue ones here, the blue ones here is mostly related to irrigation, of course, and this is a relative map, so if you have a region like in Egypt, the, the Nile Valley, which is very dry, if you add one drop of water, of course, you have a huge increase in productivity. But we even have it in the humid uh, zone in northwestern Europe, where the agroecosystems are so intensively uh, fertilized and, and used that you have increases. But in most cases, and also in, in the US, in the, in the Midwest, according to these calculations, and I admit that there are some uncertainties <laughs> related to that, uh, our results suggest that you have a, a diminishing effect of land use and productivity uh, over the landscape, of course. Uh, this may not, you, the, the, the grain size here is 10 by 10 kilometers, so of course within these 100 square kilometers you might have plots where you have a higher productivity. It's not uh, the plot scale. Uh, and this is uh, what we estimate how humans harvest this net primary productivity. So how much of the potential productivity is harvested by humans. And on this map is 
what you see when you add uh, the two things up. And you see that in almost all the cases, and especially here in Northwestern Europe, where the productivity is raised through human activities, of course, this raised plant biomass is then also harvested and, and you have a very high human appropriation of that primary productivity there. Uh, and that's kind of if you do the, if you sum up all the pixels on the globe, perhaps I should say that when we did that, we were very cautious to have a global GIS land use data set that was compatible with uh, uh, global agricultural and forestry statistics to the maximum extent that we could achieve so that you can really sum up all the pixels and get the global total that is meaningful. Yeah? And that can also be related to agricultural and forestry statistics. Yeah? Uh, so you see that in terms of, of total net primary productivity, hump is probably something around one quarter. Uh, if you just look at the above ground component, it's of course higher because we harvest a lot more of the above ground component. We have some effect on the below ground component as well because, for example, if you replace a forest with a crop field, you change the amount of carbon that goes underground yeah, because the forest allocates much more uh, biomass to the below ground component than a wheat plant does. But still the effect is much bigger in the above ground component. So you might ask, well, how much is that? A quarter? Doesn't seem so much. So it may be interesting to look at, at the table. I apologize for those sitting here. Perhaps I should <laughs> show it here. Uh, the interesting thing here is perhaps if you look at this NPP echo, the, the amount of NPP that remains in the system after harvest, because this is more or less the uh, net primary productivity we leave in the ecosystem. And you will see that there's uh, almost two thirds or about 60% of this MPP is in forests. Yeah. So, and, and you may know that forests allocate only one quarter about to harvestable plant parts because of course you don't harvest the forest each year but you wait for several decades until you harvest the, the trees. So uh, the maximum you can get here would be something around one quarter of this NPP if you harvest the timber. Yeah. Uh, so this 7% is of course a lot below the maximum that would be attainable, but of course going into the forest harvesting more there will have effects on the carbon balance of the forests. Yeah. So, and if you want to get anywhere near this, what we're doing on cropland with getting about 80%, then of course this will not be a forest anymore. I mean you have to change it from forest to annual plants to get below 20 or 25 or something percent of net primary production. Uh, then perhaps it might also be interesting to look at this unused fraction, uh, which is really the, the wilderness fraction, which is quite small. It's only about one quarter of the planet's surface outside Antarctica, and uh, so this is except Antarctica and, and uh, Greenland, of course, but uh, uh, this is almost all deserts, either dry deserts or cold deserts plus the remnants of the pristine forest ecosystems. So going there, you might have some potential to go there, but this would have huge ecological costs, as Ruth has explained yesterday. So this would really mean going to more or less the tropical rainforest area. So basically where we can go without destroying the forest is what is called here grazing and other. And the important thing here is this is all the other land that exists on the planet if you deduct the other four categories. Yeah? So all this, what people have called unused, uh, degraded, uh, abandoned, whatever land is inside that category. Yeah? And we are not using this very intensively, but about 20% of the net primary production on this land we use. Uh, or we reduce the productivity of this land through due to land degradation. Uh, so you might say, well, this we might go there, but in almost all the cases you will have some form of land competition there. Whether, it's, whether it is with formal agriculture that is market integrated or whether this is subsistence agriculture, or perhaps some of this land is really used very extensively or not at all, but mostly it is to some extent used, or at least it's not pristine in this. So some potentials are probably there, 
but little of it may be truly unused, and this is the big discussion about these abandoned and unused lands. So this is um, how we did in the last 100 years, so we have more or less doubled hum, uh, globally, and I think I should speed up a little, <laughs> because I've got many slides. So, ah, yeah, this is good, you can see the harvest. The interesting thing here is this green line is global GDP, and of course, and, and the red line is population, and you see that that hump, the blue line, has gone up quite a bit less than GDP or population. So we have increased efficiency. Uh, and if you look at this, these two lines, the gray li line is harvest, the blue line is hump. So especially since the 1950s. Uh, we have increased harvests a lot more than we have increased uh, hump. And this is more or less, oh, what, what did I do now? What, sh what should I do to get back? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so basically, basically this is uh, increasing land use intensity. So in increasing land use efficiency. Yeah, and one of the uh, w one of the things, one of the factors behind that has been discussed at this conference at length, which is increasing crop yields. Another one has not been discussed a lot, but it's maybe very important, that's in increasing feeding efficiencies uh, of livestock. Uh, and just one number, 60% of all the biomass humans harvest worldwide goes into livestock. Yeah? So this is really one big fish in the pool. Yeah? Uh, 60% and you see uh, this huge variation between regions in feeding efficiencies yeah? for ruminants. For, for the monogastrix is not as, as important, but still there is some, quite some regional divergence in feeding efficiencies. But if you look at that, it's a factor 10 difference in feeding efficiencies between different livestock systems. So there is quite some... Uh, changes in efficiency that are possible if you go into that. Uh, and there are also uh, differences between different world regions. This is just if you look at the high density developing, uh, high density industrialized, high, high density developing countries, low density industrial, low density developing, and this is hump. Uh, so that you see that of course in the low density uh, regions, hump is much lower in terms of the productivity potential of the region, it's much higher in the high density regions, but efficiency is of course a lot lower in the low density regions. So there's also some uh, evidence that you may raise efficiency in this sense. Uh, and this is a map where you can see this uh, measure it's one of the indicators of, of efficiency, which is how much do you harvest per unit of hump. It may actually get negative. This is when you increase MPP over the natural potential. Yeah. Um, so there, there, there is some decoupling between economic and population growth and also production of, for example, food or other uh, biomass-based products uh, and hump. And one of the important things is of course, uh, uh, yield grows, but of course we know we all know we have the environmental issues related to intensive farming. So some people should say we should go for organic agriculture, but that would of course mean uh, reduced uh, productivity, which would mean if consumption consumption stays the same, you need a lot more area, of course, to do that, or more efficient biomass use. Uh, but I mean one one measure to increase biomass efficiency of livestock is to feed more grains and less grazing, but this of course has issues uh, as well, as we all know. Uh, and there's also these trade-offs with, for example, uh, animal welfare that you may be aware of. So letting animals roam, of course, reduces their efficiency <laughs> because they will use some of the energy to roam instead of gaining weight. So this is also an issue that... Uh, and of course there's also this important issue that that grazing animals may play a big role for food security in many regions with agro-pastoralists, for example, where you have uh, this huge importance of, of grazers. And grazers, of course, can also use lands you cannot use for cropping. So this is 
issues to be considered when thinking about raising efficiency. So raising efficiency may be a good thing, and to a certain extent it certainly is, but uh, it also may have some costs. <laughs> That's some of the things. Well, this is just kind of the, the biomass flow uh, calculation. So we have got these biomass flow calculations on the national level for the globe and can link them consistently with land use on a pixel level. Yeah? That's basically the database which is behind the model I can show here, which is what we call the biomass balance model or BioBAM, which really just does on a biophysical level calibrated with the biomass flow data you've just seen, the balance between changes in food, fiber, and, f and feed demand channeled through this whole conversion system back to the question, how much grazing land do I need? How much grazing land do I have? On the global level in the 11 region uh, calculation. And how much cropland area do I have? How much cropland is available? And just do the balancing and then you can decide whether a certain combination of assumptions on factors is feasible or not. And this you may, for example, use to calculate how much bioenergy you might produce, for example. Or and this is basically to explore option spaces for and interactions of future changes in diets, agricultural technology, or cropland expansion. So you can feed in any combination of efficiencies or crop yield you want and see whether the balance works out. Uh, that's, there's no optimization in, inside. There's no system dynamics. It's just doing the balance. Um, and just to show a few of the results, this, these are the some assumptions we have made. Meanwhile, we have made more scenario runs with more assumptions, which is relatively easy, because we feed everything of that exogenously into the model. We, do, we don't do any uh, optimization or whatever. Huh? And this is what you get out of it, for example, if you look at how does choice of diets affect your option space. And it's very clear, if you go for a rich diet, your option space is relatively small. There's few scenarios that are feasible. Basically, if you go for towards a Western diet uh, globally, you may be able to achieve it, but only with the highest crop yields and the highest feeding efficiencies. And as you move down to a, what we've called the fair and frugal diet, which is not without any livestock product, but with little, and with an equitable distribution of food among people globally, yeah, then you've got a huge option space. There's lo lots of scenarios that are feasible. You may even go for organic agriculture and feed the world. Yeah, and still maybe have a lot of land available for doing biofuels. If you just go for yield change, you say, well, people eat whatever they eat. We cannot influence that. Uh, then you see if you go for the organic, then you have not a big option space. There's simply not enough food to, to do Western diets globally with organic agriculture. That doesn't work out. If you go for the high uh, crop yields, you have got a big option space. You may decide to eat up all the things. Then you've got a, a little, little, little area left for anything else. Or you may decide to still eat a vegetarian diet, and then you've got super, super much land available to do bioenergy. That's basically the message you get. So changes in diet have a strong effect on, on, on future land use intensity or non-food biomass potentials. Changes in agricultural intensity only have a strong effect in that sense uh, under a constant diet. But if you choose to eat up the surplus you create, then you may, we may easily eat up the surplus if we want globally. There are enough people in the world, 2050, to eat up more or less whatever we produce additionally. Yeah? And one message perhaps, global adoption of organic agriculture would be possible, but only with a very frugal diet, I'm afraid. Uh, well, I will skip that because I run out of time, but one of the key messages is you may go for bioenergy, but this will may be a game changer in terms of the human appropriation of MPP. So this is just adding 200 exajoules, 2050, results really in a deviation from the historic trend. Uh, and one thing about food consumption, we may have, we may have surprises. So this is, this is the animal product consumption, and there are some world regions where animal product consumption has started to go down a little bit, not much, 
But of course, if that would continue downwards, and if those would rise up not to that level, but perhaps to that level, this would have a big effect on, on the global system. So that's my last slide, so I hope that's kind of, <laughs> kind of okay still. Uh, changes in demand uh, will play a big role for the future uh, land use system, that's quite obvious, and it's of course dietary choices, but it's also things like food waste, and of course bioenergy, so this may have a big influence in what, what the future landscapes will look like. And the systemic feedbacks and land use competition effects will affect the outcomes. So, for example, you, you have all seen this huge discussion on the ILOC effects, on, on, uh, and I know this is very controversial and difficult to estimate, but on the other hand, not putting an ILOC number on your uh, greenhouse gas emission means you assume it's zero, which is probably also wrong. Yeah? So we have to do something about it. Uh, and of course, all these policies aiming at carbon uh, sequestration may produce leakage effects, but they will also affect uh, global land use competition. And this is something you might look at with some of these kind of approaches. And of course, also something organic. I like organic agriculture, but People endorsing organic agriculture must not forget that you have to do something about the yield effects this has. Perhaps you can improve organic agriculture with environmentally friendly methods, of course, and we hope this is possible. But uh, unless this is so, we have to care about that. So just switching to organic and doing nothing about your diet may, be, may not be a good thing to do. Yeah? And of course, uh, I think one, one thing I think is really under-investigated is how we might achieve what I call integrated optimization, so that you don't have, you know, you have food, food, you have uh, livestock, you have bioenergy, and you let them compete against each other, but you try to create uh, agroecosystems that try to maximize all three outputs together, and perhaps you might be able with quite ecologically useful methods that have a lot of cycles built into them where you could in maximize the, the three outputs combined, uh, not based on a, a kind of competition approach, but kind of on an integrated optimization approach. Thank you very much. Lunchtime, we had a great presentation about precision agriculture. Now, the, I don't speak about precision agriculture per se, but the basic point that he suggested, and that's something that almost any historical study suggested, is that generally big changes in terms of productivity and technology and conservation occur when you have big changes in prices. So, for example, so for example. If you have big changes in prices, people will adopt, uh, <coughs> will adopt uh, precision agriculture, drip irrigation, etc. And then what happens that sometimes you have a situation that agricultural land use actually going down. So if you look at the US and Europe, that the, we, the reason that we have all this subsidy program over more than 100 years is prices went up, people introduced new technology, prices went down, we want to keep. So to some extent, when you look at this optimization, it seems to me that a lot of time, if you don't take into account this type of analysis, you really miss the reality. Now, it's not that it's exotic. If you do adoption today, there is a model by Dixit and Pindak that become the most, the most dominant model of realistic uh, adoption, namely this model recognizes that you really need to have a significant price to a shot for people to make a difference. So that's one thing that we look at ILOOK, that ILOOK basically is based on static optimization, profit maximization, very little taking into account dynamic changes. What do you think? Well, <laughs> the, the point is why we do this based on biophysical modeling approaches, uh, the reason is that we 
basically come from the accounting world, not from the modeling world. Yeah, and we are trying to to understand what's going on, or to to see the full the full option space. Yeah, which you will not see if you use an integrated. I mean, we are talk a lot with the integrated uh, assessment community with people running Globiome at Yaza or uh, the LPJ Magpie. Uh, a remind model by the uh, pick people, uh, the image model model guy. The point is with with these integrated assessment models, you always have the optimal uh, scenarios, yeah. Which and you, you don't see the extreme scenarios which we can look at because we just feed in the exogenous parameters. I'm not suggesting that we do any good prediction with that. Of course not. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the thing we are interested in here is just to see uh, one, one big problem with the, all this kind of integrated assessment modeling is that it's, it's in theory it's transparent but in practice the models are so complex that even those running them only understand a part of it yeah? and this is a very simple thing this is actually a spreadsheet model yeah? And it's extremely transparent. If you think there's some result doesn't work out, you can go to the spreadsheet and see where. So perhaps this might be an interesting uh, approach um, to, to do something like a meta-analysis of different integrated assessment model runs, yeah? w which is something many people are calling for, uh, for from outside the modeling community because they feel that these integrated models are so intransparent. The models say, well, they are not insurance. I can show you every equation. Yeah, but still then, you, you, don't re you get an effect, and it's often quite hard to understand where the effect comes from. So I don't see this as an alternative approach. I see it as a complementary approach. Yeah? So I'm not denying the, the importance of price effects or introduction of technological innovation. I mean, I hope you didn't see any of that in my presentation. Yeah? But it's just the idea that you may need first an instrument where you can look at options that may exist, whether they are adopted at any time in the future or not, we don't know. But you know these optimization models have produced a lot of results that have not turned into reality as well. So that's just so that my justification that we might need a complementary approach. Yeah. One more question. <laughs> just, um, you, you showed your map of um, HAMPB due to land use change. And I guess it really struck me that it showed Illinois and Iowa <laughs> having a 50% loss of MPP due to land use change, but I, I don't quite understand where those numbers come from because you know, if you look at average corn, yield, average corn ANPP in those areas, it's about 18 tons per hectare. The native vegetation is tall grass prairie, which produces three to four tons of ANPP. So that would suggest it should have gone in the other direction, blue, not brown. Why is there such a mismatch between well, observation and prediction? Uh, I, I, can, I cannot answer this for this particular region, yeah? but I can explain how we did the calculation. And one is that we used the LPJML model to uh, estimate the NPP, the potential NPP. Yeah? And perhaps the uh, LPJ uh, model, Lund Potsdam Jena model, over, overestimated the potential net primary productivity of, of, of the central US. I have no, yeah? Uh, and the second thing is the, the current productivity we derived from agricultural statistics. Yeah? Uh, so we used uh, statistical data on, on cropland yields together with harvest indices which we did on a country level, yeah? So, and the U.S. is quite big, yeah? So we took average U.S. Uh, cropland yields for all the cultivars we looked at, yeah? Uh, and then we scaled it with potential productivity to have a spatial pattern in that. I admit that this is not a perfect procedure, <laughs> to say it politely, yeah? So, of course, one could do a lot better by looking, for example, at agricultural statistics on a, on a, on a subnational scale, yeah? And certainly we would do that if we would do it for the U.S., yeah? So, 
and perhaps then you would have a different result for for the central U.S. So I'm 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 not particularly proud of how we did in this region. I, yeah, uh, we just um, finished a big study where we looked at Europe uh, at the one kilometer grid le grid cell level, which um, is a massive amount of, of of number crunching. We tried to reconcile about 10 to 15 different statistical sources with several land use, uh, land, land cover models or data sets. Uh, and basically we reproduced the pattern we had for Europe. Yeah? But with important deviations, of course, as well. And we also saw that this potential uh, NPP from the LPJ model is really a problem in some regions. Yeah? So I'm <laughs> I, I, I will not defend this result for for the central U.S. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Illinois.